So one of the first tips that I want to give you is that even though you're doing plein air, you don't necessarily have to actually go outside. For this plein air painting, I went to my local botanical garden and you know when gouache is uh, exposed to excessive moisture or things like that, it can be kind of tricky. So you don't have to actually go outside specifically to do plein air. Um, a lot of times I'll do plein air from inside my car. I'll do uh, plein air gouache inside my apartment. You can do still lives. And all of this, I think, kind of touches in some of the other points that we're going to talk about later. But you really don't need to be too picky or persnickety about making sure that you always go outside, especially if there's bad weather or uh, things like that, you know. Um, there's a lot of things that can kind of get in our way as beginner painters or even as experienced painters. It's very easy to start letting things like the weather, the time of day, all of these things to get in our way uh, and prevent us from making art. And so that would be my first tip is like don't let the weather outside get in your way uh, and prevent you from painting. Feel free to paint inside and uh, that will help you. My second tip is to paint close to home. I went to my local botanical garden and uh, that gave me the opportunity even though the weather was really cold and kind of misty and not ideal conditions for gouache. Even though you could brave those conditions, I wasn't feeling it that day. But going to something nearby my home uh, really availed for me um, kind of the opportunity to still paint and to get outside my comfort zone to do something that was interesting but still feel a little bit protected. One of my favorite uh, impressionist plein air painters, Alfred Sisley, uh, often painted within a very close radius of his home. Uh, I believe I had heard that he never really went more than 10 miles away from his home in France. Um, we know Claude Monet paint, painted a lot of scenes near his home. And many urban sketchers, if you're not familiar with the urban sketching movement, will look at things in their home, at restaurants they go to, when they're taking their kids to school, and look at the everyday normal experiences that we do and capture that in art. That's what a sketchbook's for. That's what these practices are for. And so you want to know, don't feel like you have to go somewhere far away or find something that's super grandiose. You can paint what's in front of you. And the most important thing, I think, is to look for something uh, and to just get out there and to do your sketching, to do your plein air, plein air painting. Um, and the more that you do that, the more experience you're going to get so that when you do go to an amazing location, like I just recently had some videos where I went to Colorado and painted this amazing waterfall, you know, but if I wouldn't have had that practice of painting creek beds and uh, alleyways just around my house, then I maybe wouldn't have been as equipped to actually rise with the challenge of painting the beautiful mountain uh, waterfall scene that was before me. So sometimes, you know, you can think about just get out there and paint, just get out there and do something that's in front of you and it'll help you see the beauty that's all around you, but it will also help train you up for when you are in one of those incredible locations. I think one of the things that often hinders me from going out to paint is waiting for there to be perfect lighting or perfect weather or just the perfect situation. And the truth of the matter is, is that very rarely are you going to have like the energy and the time when the sun is just perfect and you've got like a perfect subject matter and you feel like painting, like all of those stars don't always align, right? We almost want to kind of train ourselves in the same way that people train themselves to go to the gym. You know, most of us, if we went to the gym and exercise just when we felt like it, or if we ate healthy and drank water and slept just when we felt like it, a lot of times we would only exercise and eat healthy like once a year, maybe less than that, right? And so you kind of want to train yourself in the same way that an athlete trains themselves or an academic trains themselves to sometimes do that work even when you don't feel like it, to do um, go out there and train yourself, like I was saying with the previous point, because it will help you when those conditions are perfect. It'll help you when, um, when the stars do align, you'll be in good shape and ready to go. So don't create an excuse for yourself that you need the most beautiful scene or the perfect weather or the perfect lighting. 
just pick kind of what's in front of you. And that sort of ties in with the next step that I wanna talk about, which is don't be too picky about what you paint. I know that that was something that I struggled with for a really long time. I still struggle with because I think we all kind of instinctively wanna paint something beautiful or grandiose, um, especially when we look at other people's artwork, we see things that are you know, maybe just really beautiful and amazing to look at. We wanna capture that too. But oftentimes I, I find for myself, there have been many times where I go out to try to find something to paint and nothing really you know, hits that spot for me. Nothing really like makes me feel awestruck and I end up just walking around for half an hour to an hour and then I get discouraged and I give up and I don't actually paint. That's something that we wanna fight against. And so, you know, I have been trying to like really lower the bar for myself to not have like too high of expectations and to not try to find like the perfect scene. But I recommend just go and look for kind of the first thing that even slightly grabs your attention. That's what I did here. I was walking around this beautiful garden and there are so many you know, beautiful flowers and interesting things to look at and I didn't really have something specific in mind and I walked around for a little bit. I probably walked around a little bit too long, about 15 minutes or so. And I kind of just didn't know what I wanted to sketch and I sat down on this bench and I saw this voodoo lily right in front of me. And so I decided, you know what? My search is over. I'm gonna go ahead and decide what I'm gonna paint right now. It's basically what's in front of me. And that's something that I recommend to a lot of my students. Just paint whatever is in front of you. And then you kind of have a creative problem to solve. How are you going to paint it? Um, what, you know, how are you gonna frame it? What is your composition going to be? How are you gonna treat that as an artist? And you can really kind of flex your artistic muscles by not being too picky about what you paint. You know, if you have access to beautiful mountains and landscapes, then go for that. But if you don't and you just have your apartment or um, you know industrial scenes or whatever you live nearby, find a way to capture that. And you know, that will be like an, a unique artistic vernacular for you that if you get really good at painting alleyways or city scenes or street scenes, that that can actually become almost like your superpower that differentiates you from other artists. You know, there's a lot of artists who paint ocean waves. There are a lot of artists who paint country barns, but what do you have in front of you that you can paint that will make what you do interesting, right? So don't be too picky about what you choose to paint. One of the things that I did for this painting and I highly recommend for beginners in gouache or any plein air painters is to use a limited palette. Technically, usually a limited palette is like five or less colors. But in this case, I'm actually only using a triad of colors, three colors plus white. And typically that's all you need. You need some type of a red, some type of a blue, some type of a yellow and white. You can even pare your paintings down to just black and white or just a warm and a cool. I've done experiments where I just painted with blue and orange or complementary colors. Um, I do a lot of black and white paintings, which really helps with your tonal values, which we'll talk about later. But um, using a limited palette like that helps you really learn the strengths and weaknesses of certain colors. And so I like to experiment with different reds, with different blues, with different yellows. For this painting, I was using a quinacridone regenta, which is a very strong color I don't use very often. So this was maybe the first time that I actually used that color I was getting to know it. Plus Prussian blue and yellow ochre and white, titanium white. So. You can pick any colors you want. There's more traditional uh, primaries that you can use, or you can get kind of exotic with the colors that you choose. That part's not as important as much as limiting the bandwidth. By using um, a limited palette, you're gonna have more color harmony. You're gonna learn more about what those colors can and can't do. You're going to, by nature, focus more on some of the other aspects of art one of the most important being tonal values. So that brings us to our next tip. When you're painting something, focus on getting tonal values more than other features of the artwork. The more that you focus on tonal values, the more that your image is gonna look realistic, the more that you're gonna be able to capture a sense of depth and three-dimensionality. Typically, these are things that we're looking for to depict in our art in some way. 
Um, you can be loose, you can be tight, you can have different aspects of your style. That's not as important. Um, whatever style you're trying to achieve, however uh, detailed or impressionistic you're trying to be, tonal values are one of the most important things. One thing that you'll hear a lot of people say is that color gets all the credit, but tonal values does all of the work. So a lot of artists really focus on that aspect of realism, and that's achieved through not details or you know the fineness of your drawing. It's really achieved through tonal values. And tonal values will cover up a lot of mistakes, which I had a lot of mistakes in this painting. Um, I'm constantly learning myself, and you will be too, as you keep doing paintings. Don't get hung up on your mistakes, but focus on setting certain goals and then trying to improve on those goals. And one of the most important goals you can set as a beginner plein air painter is to try to get accurate tonal values. When you're doing a plein air painting, you can essentially take two different approaches. You can look and zoom way out for like a broad vista, think a big landscape or things like that, or you can zoom way in, almost like doing a portrait. And that's what I opted for in this case. I could have kind of painted the whole scene of the botanical garden that I was in in this greenhouse, but it was so complex and so detailed and so many different colors and textures and perspective that I kind of wanted to narrow my focus down just on one thing. And so that's why I picked just this one plant, this voodoo lily to focus on the individual forms of it, to focus on the individual colors and tonal values and shapes just of this one plant. And you can do that in a forest, you can do that in a broad vista to zoom way in. I think a lot of times our tendency is to zoom way out or to try to capture everything in our paintings, but you really don't need to do that. And the more that you're able to focus on just painting and zooming in on one thing, the more that that's gonna train you for other things as well. As I mentioned, I'm constantly making mistakes, making adjustments, making corrections. That's one of the beauties of painting in gouache. It, you don't have to paint systematically like you do in watercolor. You can jump around from light to dark. You can keep refining your tonal values. But ultimately, as a beginner, don't worry about your paintings being perfect. They're not going to be perfect even after years of painting mine art. And one of the things that you wanna remember is that every painting that you do contains a lesson for the next painting that you do. Don't feel bad, don't feel uh, guilty if your painting doesn't turn out perfectly. Let that energy charge you for the next painting. And I find that a lot of beginners are a little bit too harsh on themselves. Painting should be something pleasurable and enjoy enjoyable. So let yourself enjoy it. Don't beat yourself up. You don't have to be perfect and let yourself learn the lessons that this painting has to teach you. Let, let you know yourself analyze it and say, what did I do wrong? And look at that with a critical eye and write down some lessons and some goals for your next painting. Maybe think about how could I correct this painting? But at the same time, look at what you did right. Um, even if all you did right was go out there and paint, there's always some things that you did right. And we want to have a truthful eye. We want to train our eye to look accurately at the scene. And we also want to train our mind and our spirit to also look at the situation accurately. So don't just look at your mistakes and just let yourself see that disqualifying the positives that you did. Take it all in, the good and the bad. And that's only going to help you as an artist in the long run. One of the things I love doing about this painting was thinking about the shape and the form of the petals of this plant. What an interesting and unique plant to paint. Look at everything that we look at in nature has a unique shape, a unique form, and try to paint that contour. As the leaves and the petals turn, I'm trying to move my brush along the edges of that contour as well to adjust those shapes, to paint along the contours of that, to create that form. Think about your painting like it's a three-dimensional sculpture and you're carving out those shapes. That's one of the beautiful things about plein air painting, not just the deliciousness of color and shape and texture, but also the deliciousness of three-dimensional form. One of the funnest things that we can do as plein air painters is to learn about the subject, especially if you're coming to something brand new, maybe something you don't know about. When I went to pick this flower to paint, I didn't really know anything about it but they had some information about it and I researched later on. One of the things that I learned about it was that part of this flower is actually used to create shirataki noodles 
one of my favorite things to eat. There are so many cool things that uh, derive from the voodoo lily. And um, learning about that, whether you can um, see some of my other paintings where I've painted a lot of historical landmarks in my city. And I've learned so much more about the place that I live by doing urban sketching, by doing plein air painting and researching these buildings and places and things that I go to to do these sketches. Let plein air painting help inform you about the things that you're, you're painting and seeing. Plein air painting can be a foil for creating adventures for ourselves for going to new places or be staying in the places that we've always been, but seeing it in a new light. Everything is interesting. Everything has something interesting about it and everything has some beauty in it. Let plein air painting for you open your eyes and the windows to your soul to see and think about that. It reminds me of a great quote by Ellen Parr. She says, the cure for boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. So be curious, be interested, see the beauty all around you and use these 10 tips to go explore the world, enjoy the process of art making, get better each time. Remember, you have a voice that matters. Go be creative. I'll see you next time.